News today that Donald Trump has narrowed it down to four top candidates. They are all names except for one that you haven't heard a lot about from me, but they are all names that hopefully if you watch this show, reminder to subscribe if you haven't, to hit the bell, all that good stuff. Give me a like because it helps with the algorithm, etc. You probably are somewhat familiar with. We can debate them and I'm going to look at your comments here in live time. But I want to first go to Donald Trump speaking about this a few months ago with a former colleague of mine over on Fox News. Here he is telling him what his plan is for VP. You said in our town hall that you had an idea or you might have already decided about your VP pick. When do you think you're going to make that? Well, it's never really had that much of an effect on an election, which is an amazing thing. Both election and primary, it's never really had much of an effect. I may or may not release something uh, over the next couple of months. There's no rush to that. It won't have any impact at all. The person that I think I like is a very good person, a pretty standard. I think people won't be that surprised. But I would say there's probably a 25% chance it would be that person. Is Senator Tim Scott on the list now? No, he's a great guy. You know, he, he endorsed me. There's an example. Nikki comes from South Carolina. Tim Scott is from South Carolina. But if you look, the governor, great governor, another senator, Lindsay, we happen to like Lindsay. But uh, Henry McMaster knows her very well. He endorsed me. It's very hard for a governor to endorse somebody when you have, you know, I mean, Henry McMaster was the lieutenant governor under her and he endorsed me and he's going to be here tonight in 15 minutes. You're going to be watching him speak. I'm going to introduce him. He's a great guy. He's done a great job. So everybody, almost everybody in South Carolina has endorsed me. What? So he likes Tim Scott. Tim Scott, of course, from South Carolina and Tim Scott checks the box, but I guarantee you I actually know this for a fact. He does not care. It's not like he has to have a woman or he has to have a black or he has to have a Hispanic. Like it's, it's not him. He's like, okay, who is going to help me win? And I don't think he believes that this person will actually do it, right? Like, I, how do I say this? I mean, I, I knew Pence back in the day. He turned out ultimately, um, well, you know, look, I have mixed feelings on Pence, but, you know, I think that the, the one big problem with Pence before we go on to all the candidates, is that occasionally he was just sort of the wind-up doll, right? Doing as he was told. And I think this is a good example of it. Mike Pence, when he sat down with Tucker Carlson and Nevent, and I'll tell you, these politicians that don't listen, like it's a problem. They're all geared up. They want to say something. And Tucker really th just threw him for a loop here. And was talking about Ukraine and the spending. And at some point, like Pence said something crazy. I think you remember it well. But as long as we don't get a candidate like this, I think we're pretty good. Anyway, let's go to Mike Pence. January, we'll let somebody transfer some jets. I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President. Have you, I know you're running for president. You are, distra you. You are distressed notice. that the Ukrainians don't have enough American tanks. Every city in the United States has become much worse over the past three years. Yeah. Drive around. There's not one city that's gotten better in the United States. Right. And it's visible. Our economy has degraded. The suicide rate has jumped. Public filth and disorder and crime have exponentially increased. Right. And yet your concern is that the Ukrainians, a country most people can't find on a map, who've received tens of billions of U.S. tax dollars don't have enough tanks. Right. I think it's a fair question to ask, like, where's the concern for the United States in that? Well, it's not my concern. <laughs> Tucker, I've heard that routine from you before, but that's not my concern. What? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, career ender right there. I'm going to... I'm going to try and give him the benefit of the doubt and just think he was on autopilot and not listening to anything that Tucker said. That's, that's their biggest problem in politics. I mean, by the way, one of Trump's biggest problems is he actually does listen. I actually appreciate this about him. He listens to the question. His problem is that he actually answers it. <laughs> and that tends to get him in a little bit of trouble now and then. I'm thinking back to those days in May 2020 when one reporter asked, any chance this virus might have come from Wuhan, China? And he said, yes, I've seen intelligence to that. Oh, my gosh, you want to you tick off the establishment. 
there you go. I mean, the next day, the cover of Nature, and the, every other website. I mean, by the way, you couldn't even talk about it here. I mean, it was insane, right? Just totally insane. But his problem, again, is that he actually answers the question that the, re, the, the reporter is asking. In, in Pence's case, he's not listening. He just doesn't, I think, and again, this is benefit of the doubt, or maybe he really doesn't care about the American people. Maybe he thinks that his job as vice president of the United States is to be in charge of Ukraine policy, right? Kind of like somebody else was in charge of Ukraine policy, right? Well, his son, his son was getting $83,000 a month on the board of Burisma, a natural gas, now defunct energy company that was known for its corruption. Yeah, it's funny how they, they got him. They got him on that gun charge, right? But what about everything else? Like, what about the real stuff? I'm still sitting there going, but what about, what about, what about, what about Ukraine? And I, ah, oh, nothing to see here. And I'm still not comfortable with it. I'm really not. Because Joe Biden is on record saying he got rid of the guy that was investigating the company that his son works for. But he didn't bother telling anybody his son was working for that company at that time and being paid $83,000 a month for it. I mean, how is it that his son is all over the place, whether it be Ukraine or China for that matter, promoting bad energy, right? Well, insisting that we all be green here. Somehow everybody else gets to pump natural gas and they get the likes of Hunter Biden there on their board helping them do it. Come on. Something's not right. Back to the vice presidential pick. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have news that Donald Trump has narrowed it down to four key candidates. Here we go. You ready? J.D. Vance, Doug Burgum, Marco Rubio, and Tim Scott. There's a little straw poll that was recently done and the results of which suggested that J.D. Vance was ahead. I wouldn't put too much stock in that poll. I mean, it's a straw poll and the attendees at the event, you know, they, they have their own biases, but this is not going to make or break the ticket. It's only going to help on the margin for Donald Trump. So then you get down to, okay, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these guys? I mean, I like Vance. You know that I like J.D. Vance because I think he really would help represent the Midwest. He is from Ohio, of course. He's representing the state of Ohio in the Senate. And he knows what it's like to be struggling in America. He grew up in a, in a very poor area in Appalachia. So he, I mean, that was sort of how he came to everybody's radar and attention with his big book about that crisis and the addiction that so many people are facing in these poorer parts of the, the country. So he is very empathetic with that. He understands that. And I think he would do very well in terms of helping to garner some support, additional support in the Midwest, which is really critical, right? You got you to gotta get those Midwestern states. If you can get that, then guess what? It's home run. Burgum, Governor Burgum of North Dakota. I hope I got that right and didn't. It's not South Dakota. I think I got that right. Anyway, <laughs> you probably never heard of him. That's why only 7% of the people were actually in favor of him. But you just heard Trump, you know, maybe somebody that's not really that big a deal. He's a businessman and I think relates to Donald Trump on that level. So that is a possibility, but he probably doesn't bring sort of the oomph in the Midwest that, say, a J.D. Vance would. Tim Scott. 15.4% in favor in this straw poll for Tim Scott. Now, Tim Scott checks a lot of boxes. He's from South Carolina. I think he's going to get South Carolina anyway. I think there's a role for Tim Scott in the future. I don't necessarily think it's going to be VP. I mean, it could be. But increasingly now, I'm hearing a, a, a couple things. I'm hearing from a lot of people within the campaign that it's going to be Governor Burgum. I tend to not trust that entirely because I have a feeling that, that they kind of use some decoys, which is why I'm kind of coming back to Marco Rubio, which is very interesting. And I know that I said recently that it's not going to be anybody from Florida because of the, of, of the constitution and the reality that you just actually can't have two candidates from Florida. The founding fathers deliberately set it up that way. So you wouldn't accumulate too much power in one specific place, but here's the, but some of you in the chat and in the comments were like, but Donald Trump could run from New York or New Jersey. Let me just tell you, he's not going to do that. You know why? He's got too much money. 
right? Like that's too involved. It's great to relocate to Florida. You think he wants to relocate to New York where Letitia James can really and truly go after everything? It's never going to happen, never in a zillion years. So get that out of your head. Trump is not going to change his residence. Florida's great for him. But you know who doesn't have any money? <laughs> I mean, he may have a little, but not, not like the former president. That would be Marco Rubio. So this happened with Cheney and Bush. Cheney just somehow moved his residency. And Cheney actually had a fair amount, but he, he managed to move it. Could, could Marco Rubio do the same? I think he could. And Marco Rubio speaks Spanish. He is able to ingratiate himself with a lot of Hispanics. I mean, if Donald Trump won't call him little Marco anymore. <laughs> and as long as we make sure that he has enough water at all times, we don't have to run into any scary incidents. Look, we'll see. I think the good news is no matter who gets it, it's, it's stuff that's sort of on the margin because people know who they're voting for and they're not going to just vote for the VP. They're going to vote for the president. And so these are the final four. I think Marco's interesting and Marco is a name that I hadn't been hearing a lot. So that, that strikes me as, as a possibility. I, we'll see. Right? We'll see. We'll find out soon. We'll find out very, very soon. So stay tuned. We're going to keep all eyes on it.